So this is exciting because we're going to transition from the first phase of calculus, which is limits, to the second phase of calculus, the big topic of derivatives. And so this video, we're going to make that transition, and we're going to look at the limit definition, the limit definition of derivative. All right, so we're, we'll get to the derivative eventually. We're going to start with uh, something called secant lines given a function. And from secant lines, we'll look at what are called tangent lines. And then that's going to lead us to derivatives. So we've got a few steps to get there. So the first thing we're going to do is look at, um, let's, let's, suppose that we have, let's suppose we have some function f. We'll call this function f, right? And... Uh, let's say that this function is a curve. We don't want to look at a straight line. That's not a very interesting case for us. But let's say this function is, is a curve. We'll make it kind of maybe an upside down parabola, something like that, uh, just for an example. And let's look at, uh, let's pick a particular point on this curve. Let's say, let's say we pick this point right here whose corresponding x value is a, for example. Okay, so what we want to do here is we want to be able to construct what are called secant lines using this point. So the first thing I want to do is if I want a secant line, a secant line, a secant line passes through two points on a curve. So it's a line that passes through two points on the curve. So I'll give you some examples of secant lines. For example, if I have a point over here, then this, this line here is the secant line through those two points. Simple enough, right? And you can imagine you could create numerous secant lines uh, you could have a secant line over here going between this point and this point, right? Uh, they're not perfectly straight, but you get the idea. So those are secant lines. So what we're interested in here is what we call the secant line slope. We're going to start with the secant line slope. So I have to remember how to find the slope of a line. And this is sort of a generic function at a generic x value a. And furthermore, we need some way to define the location of the other point forming our secant line. Um, and since I wrote this in red, I'm going to go back and focus on the secant line slope that I've drawn in red here. And one way to do this is to, rather than label the x value here as some other letter like b, a different way to do that is to create a distance from this current x value of a. So what, what we'll do is we'll say, let's, let's assume that, um, uh, you know what, let's, let's look at the green point for simplicity. I don't want to confuse you right off the bat. So I'll, I'll switch to my green marker and we'll look at the green point. So what we'll do is we'll define this distance from a to the x value for the green point, we're going to create that as our, our variable h. So h is often used as that distance from the a value. And of course, if that distance is h, then this corresponding x value would be a plus that h distance. Okay. So if you're wondering why I switched from the red point to the green point, it's because I, I want this to be a natural choice. If we're going to the right, we're going to add h. Now, really, h can be a positive or negative value. So if I chose h to be this distance over here, I'd consider it to be negative, And this x value for the red point would still be considered a plus h. All right, so that's... Uh, may not be as intuitive. So we'll, we'll look at the intuitive side here of A. Now, how do we get the, the secant line slope in this case? 
Well, we have to, we have to calculate the rise between these two points. And the way to do that would be to subtract their y values, right? Subtract their y values. So what we'll do is we'll start with the green y value, the a plus h y value, and we'll subtract the a y value. Now, what are the y values for these two x values? Well, the y value for a is the same thing as saying the output of a. Well, the output of a for the f function is just f of a. Okay? The output for a plus h is f of a plus h. And so the secant line slope is going to be the y value minus the y value. Now, I'm, I'm always going to use my a plus h point first and my a point second when I'm doing my slope. It doesn't matter which one you do first, as long as you're consistent on calculating your rise and your run in the same direction both times. So I'm going to do this y value minus that y value to get the distance between those. So f of a plus h minus f of a over h. Oh, I'm sorry. Not I, I jumped the gun there. <laughs> So this is, this is the y change. This is the rise of this line. Then I need the run of the line, so I have to subtract the x values. Okay? Uh, to get the run, I'm going to do the a plus h point again minus the a point. I'm going to go in the same order, a plus h first, a second. So I'm going to subtract the x values, so I'll take a plus h minus a. Right? This x value minus this x value. And over here, I did this y value minus this y value. It is pretty standard to do the a plus h first in this, in this format when you're doing secant line slope. And now, maybe you can see that this formula for the secant line slope, this generic secant line slope formula, will simplify on the bottom because a minus a is 0. So we actually just have h as our denominator. And on top, we've got the y value for a plus h minus the y value for a, okay? And that's how you get the secant line slope. So that's good. Um, no problem there. Again, recognize that h could be positive or negative. It's just a distance to the right or to the left of the fixed value a. Now, what I want to do is transition to the tangent line, okay? The tangent line slope. So the secant line is a, or a secant line, there's a bunch of them. A secant line passes through two points on the curve. A tangent line is an interesting case. Um, if I want the tangent line here, what I'm really interested in, um, I don't have a straight edge sitting around. Uh, yeah, I do. have an old license plate sitting here. So when I'm looking at the tangent line, the tangent line sort of near this point only touches the curve once. So the tangent line here looks something like that at this particular point. Okay? So there's our tangent line. Now the problem is if I want the tangent line slope, we typically need two points to calculate a rise and a run. And the tangent line only passes through one point when you look close here. Sometimes the curve could come back up and it hit twice. That's not what we're interested in. I want to know the tangent line slope at this one point right here. So how do we find the slope of a line if we only know one point? Well, the good news is we have limits. Not lemons, limits. If, if h, if this distance here, h, goes to zero. I'd like this distance to get really tiny, right? As h gets smaller, this green point on our secant line keeps getting closer and closer to our blue point here. And so the secant line slope keeps getting closer to the tangent line slope. So the key to this process is I'm going to pretend that I have two points. And then what I'm going to do is use limits to make them 
infinitely close, and that's going to tell us how to calculate our tangent line slope. So how do I make the points get close? Well, what we do is we take, we take our secant line slope. It's pretty easy to remember the secant line slope. Y, you take the difference of the y values, you take the difference of the x values, and then the x values simplify. So there's our secant line slope. And then what I want to do with that is I want to take the limit, and I want to let that h value go to 0. Okay? I want to take the limit as h goes to 0. And that's how you get the secant line slope, or sorry, the tangent line slope. So the secant line slope uses two points. The tangent line slope appears to use two points, but then as you, t you take the limit as h goes to 0, a plus h and a get infinitely close, and this turns into one point. And if you can evaluate that limit, then you can find the slope of your tangent line. Okay? Now, this is so important, this tangent line slope. So, so let's discuss why. When you look at the secant line slope, what you're doing, uh, if you take, go back to that green line, you're looking at a, a rate of change, a change in y per a change in x. That's what your slope is. But you're doing it over a time frame. So you're going, when you look at, maybe let's look at the red line in instead. Here, you're looking at a rate of change from this point to this point, And you're sort of ignoring what the function actually does. So what you're doing is you're taking an average rate of change from this, from this point to this point, ignoring the path that the function actually took. All you're concerned with are the two endpoints. So the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. This is that sort of idea. So for secant line slope, what we're doing is we're getting the average, the average rate of change, the average rate of change over time, over a period of time. OK? In this case, if we look at the green line, our period of time is h, right? Over that period of time, this would be how much our y values change per how much our x values change. Now, the cool thing about the tangent line slope is it is a, still a rate of change because it's a slope, but it's a, it's a rate of change at a particular moment in time, at the singular point. So this is your, what we call, instantaneous, instantaneous rate of change. Okay? Now the other thing is, um, in, in the secant line slope example, this is occurring, uh, the secant line slope here is between a plus h and a, while over here the tangent line slope is at the single moment in time, it's just at a. So when we say instantaneous rate of change, it's just at a. When we say average rate of change, we're going from a to a plus h. That's our period of time that we'd be defining here. Okay? Now, that's fantastic that we can get instantaneous rates of change using limits of a secant line slope. It's so fantastic, it gets its own, it gets its own notation and own name in calculus. So this thing here is what we call the derivative, the derivative, derivative just means tangent line slope. So the derivative of the function f at a, all right? So the derivative of the function f at a. The notation for that is, if you want to indicate the derivative of a function f, you indicate that with what's called a prime. It's like an apostrophe. Not a one, it's more like an apostrophe. Okay? So it's called f prime. f prime means the derivative of f. And then if we want to say at a, then we do a parentheses a. It's kind of like its own function. f prime of a means the derivative of f at a f prime of a. So this is the tangent line slope of the function at a. 
And A is this value here in our formula. So if I wanted f prime of 2, if we're working a very specific example, then I would take the limit as h goes to 0 of f of 2 plus h minus f of 2 all over h. So that's an introduction to what the derivative is using limits. I'll follow up with some videos with examples of how you could use things like this.